Welcome, everyone. My name is Elaine Chacon Brown. I'm a wine writer and global wine educator. And I'm going to say the thing you're not supposed to say at these events, which is that I am feeling emotional. <laughs> this is a big deal. <laughs> and to get a room full of farmers, media, investors, researchers, designers, engineers, all together for this occasion is a historic moment. <clears throat> I was talking to John Williams just a minute ago, as many of you know, he's the founder of Frog Sleep, and he was saying that 10 years ago, he and his son, Rory Williams, went to Europe to a tractor show because they wanted to buy an electric tractor, and it did not exist. The technology did not exist. Today, we're launching the world's first fully electric, automated smart tractor driver optional smart tractor. Again, this is a historic moment. Bringing all of these technologies together in one machine is truly incredible. And we have the chance to respond to climate change, to respond as, a, as part of climate action through how we farm and to, by bringing the technology that we need into the equipment that we use. So I started writing about wine about 10 years ago, and one of the very first things I did was go to a farm worker health care and education day in Oregon, actually. And at the time, it just seemed like the obvious thing to do, that if I was going to write properly about wine, I needed to understand how it was farmed and who did the work to make that happen. And the truth is, what I found out was that uh, magazines weren't interested in farming and farmers at the time. That the writing about wine was fully focused on lifestyle and what was in the bottle itself. And I'm pleased to say that I continue to focus on farming and trying to understand sustainability as well through my career. And today, magazines are clamoring for these kinds of articles. And that's part of why we also have media here today to focus on technology, on how we can help the farm workers and the farmers to scale up. I'm also really excited to say that even though I happen to focus on wine, what we are representing today is a movement in dairy, in nuts, in orchard fruits, in row crops, and in wine, in all crops. This is a change that can revolutionize farming altogether. One of the things that I find really fascinating about Monarch, so as a side note, I've been following this story for a little bit more than two years, um, which is part of why they asked me to MC today. I really thank you for, for doing that. Thank you for including me. But one of the things that's truly incredible about this Project Monarch Tractor is that it brings together le world leading experts in robotics, in automation, people that have, could have gone into and actually have had successful careers in aerospace, in engineering of all sorts, um, expertise in, uh, again, in automation, robotics, how, bringing all of these things together in one machine is truly incredible. And one of the things that I asked us to speak about today is why a tractor? Why would someone that has had success with Tesla, with NASA, with all of these other world famous companies change directions and come into building a tractor? And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today. I'm thrilled about that. So to get us started, I'd like to introduce Carlo Mondavi. He's Besides being a celebrity, um, he's also a co-founder and the chief farming officer of Monarch Tractor. He's a fourth generation farmer from one of the most, um, from the Mandavi family who's had an incredible impact on bringing world attention to the quality possible from California. And he actually was also a co-founder of the Monarch Challenge, which he's going to talk a little bit about today, which is the namesake of Monarch Tractor. He's also the co-founder, co-owner of Rain Winery and a partner in Continuum. And I'm thrilled to invite Carlo up today to get us started. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, thank you all for being here today. It, it, it's such an honor to have you at our Monarch campus, our headquarters. Uh, thank you all. Um, this has been a long time coming, and today we're launching a revolutionary technology that is going to change the way we farm, making farms 
more profitable, making us as farmers more independent, all while protecting our planet's biodiversity, the farm microbiome, the soil microbiome, the farm biology. And I really quickly, Elaine alluded to this, I want to thank all the farmers here today uh, and, and all the, the broadness of farmers, not just the wine growers, but the orchard growers from citrus and nuts to all of our fruit and vegetable farmers. Thank you guys all for being here. It means the world that you're here. Uh, I thought that I would share my family story and the perspective and how I got involved in this technology, this brilliant technology company. I'm a farmer and a winemaker first. My family has been farming now in this beautiful state, in this beautiful country for just over 100 years. Uh, my great-grandfather, Cesare, and my great-grandmother, Rosa, got us into the wine business when they immigrated from Italy. My grandfather, Robert, took us to the next level. My uncle, Michael, who is here, my father, Tim, my aunt, Marcy, continue to rise. And I thought that I would talk, because we measure climate in wine. When we enjoy a great bottle of wine, we talk about the site, we talk about the team, the domain, and then we talk about the variable. The variable is climate. Was it a good year? Was it a challenging year? Did it rain all growing season? Were you able to ripen your fruit? Was it too hot? When you look at wine, we perspire acidity through the cell wall of the grape. So hot years, less acidity, more sunlight transfers to more photosynthesis equals richer, riper wines. Cooler years, you retain acidity. You don't get as much photosynthetic energy. Leaner, cr leaner crunchier, fresher, more vibrant wines. And so I thought it'd be fun to break up my family's 100 years into three different eras and talk about the climate impact of those three eras. So the first era is while my family was at Charles Krug. And just a little bit before, from 1919 to 1966, and just before that, in 1883, the very first coal power plant was built, the Edison in London. And later on that decade, the very first combustion automobile, combustion engine automobile was built, the Carl Benz from the Mercedes-Benz company. And that began the technology at the time, fossil fuel. So in this era, 50 years, we increased by 20 parts per million, roughly. So just a slight increase didn't actually affect change in us. And when you look at these era, this era, if you take a decade, we had maybe nine cool vintages and one warm vintage. So we would be thrilled about the warm vintage. The next era, while my family was at Robert Mondavi from 1966 until 2004, in this era, it's about 40 years, and we increased by 70 parts per million. So 10 years fewer than the previous era, but really a big increase. In this era, it flips about nine warm vintages and one cool vintage. Climate change was affecting us, but it had yet to really, really challenge us. In fact, I would say that this would be the golden era if the previous era was the era of elegance. Really, think about the, the decades of the 80s and the 90s and how beautiful those wines are. And then the era that we're in today, from 2004 until current day, this is the era where my grandfather Robert, my father Tim, my Aunt Marcy began Continuum, my uncle Michael began Folio, my brother Dante and I went off on our own, we began rain. And then my wife is a farmer and a winemaker from Italy. She has a great winery in Barolo and we started a tiny project called Sori della Sorba. In this era, it's about 17 years. And we've increased by 30 parts per million. It's, it's wild. We're now at 420 parts per million as a planet. And when you zoom out and you look at this from a macro perspective, this is 1,000 years. If you were to go back 10,000 years, that line is very, very steady very even for the last previous, so not the last 100 years, but the 9,900 years before that. And that steady climate allowed for us as humanity to thrive. It allowed for us to grow our civilization and have great reliance on being able to produce foods. And so when you look at this last era I was talking about previously, the era that we're in today, that decade, so if you take since 2012 to current day, we're not having nine warm vintages or, and one cool vintages or nine cool vintages and one warm vintage. We're seeing vintages like in 2017 or 2015 where my family lost half of our crop due to drought and poor set. 2017, my family lost 30% of our crop due to wildfire. The wildfires came back in 2020, this time much more catastrophic and earlier. Dante and I lost 65% of our crop at rain and my family lost 100% of our crop at continuum we won't be making a bottle of Continuum in 2020. 
And then this last vintage, and I'm, this is, this rain, we're so blessed to have this rain, you guys. We are now in our third, yes. And thank you guys for making it out in the rain. Let's go. <laughs> um, this is the third consecutive driest year that we've had since 1896. We are in a massive drought. So this rain is much appreciated. This last harvest, my, fi my family lost half of our crop due to drought and poor set. So we've had now four catastrophic years in a decade. So wine or, or climate change doesn't just affect the quality of our crop, it affects our ability to have a crop. And it doesn't just affect our crop, it affects our community. This is in the town of Santa Rosa in Sonoma in 2017. 900 homes burnt in a matter of hours. All firefighters could do was literally knock on doors and say, get out. The winds were too fierce. It was too dry and too hot. It was terrifying. So this affects our communities, our friends, our loved ones. My family feels lucky. Even though we've lost so much of our crop, we still have our winery, we still have our house. We can't see the same for many of our friends. So I want to shift topics and talk really quickly about our, our planet. Um, I want to talk about our planet's biodiversity. Our farmlands are national treasures. And currently, our agricultural landscape makes up 20% of our planet's greenhouse gas emissions and 50% of our planet's inhabitable land and uses 70% of our water resources. When you think about that, look at California, for example. California is 100 million acres of land, of which 43 million of those acres are farmland. So what we put into our soils and what we do on our farmland affects everything. And today, as it stands, we use roughly 9 billion pounds of pesticides and 100 million tons of fertilizers. The most alarming thing about this number is the 5 billion pounds of herbicides. It's the one thing where you can have 100% reduction by mowing or tilling or crimping or whatever fancy way you like to cut the grass, or you can use 100% by being able to just spray a chemical. And so along my journey, prior to beginning Monarch Tractor with my brilliant co-founders and this incredible team that we have, I started a challenge called the Monarch Challenge. And the Monarch Challenge was to create awareness within the farming community about these dangerous chemicals in agriculture. Because I know one thing that unites the most conventional farmer and the most organic farmer. And that one thing is that we all care deeply about our planet, we care deeply about our soils, we care deeply about our families. And so learning about the human health impact and learning about the environmental impact, I felt that if I just went out and talked with farmers, surely we'd be able to migrate away from these chemicals. The reason why it's called the Monarch Challenge is because since the introduction of Roundup glyphosate in 1974, kind of as the flag in the ground, as an era of when we really began using more chemicals directly into our food ecosystem, since this time in 74, the monarch population of butterflies has declined by 99% and they're now on the brink of extinction. Monarchs are now critically endangered. They, in fact, it's, it's pretty ironic and pretty incredible that we're launching this tractor the same year that they got put onto the endangered species list. Well overdue, I think, by the way. And the three things that are harming the monarchs, migratory path disruption, climate change, and pesticides. And these are three things that we can address through our tractor. So the idea of the Monarch Challenge was to go out and talk with farmers. Because I knew that if we simply talked about it, that not one farmer would want to use these chemicals. And what I ended up running into was wall after wall. And it was heartbreaking. It was one of the most depressed I've ever been. The first challenge was that there was an economic divide. I would talk to families and they would literally say, we didn't know about this, but I've got to put food on my table for my family. I've got to put my kids through college. I quickly learned there was an economic divide. And I quickly learned that 45% of the farms in America are not profitable. And globally, family, 80% of the farms around the world are family owned and operated. So with a tear in their eye, they said, we have to figure this out, but we, chemicals right now are more effective, more efficient for us. And then I would talk to other farmers and they'd say, yeah, we realize herbicides are not ideal. We realize that synthetic systemics are not ideal. But right now, if I want to go down the organic route, I have to turn my compact tractor on and drive it more often. And turning on one compact tractor the size of Monarch, but diesel, is like turning on 14 cars. And it's NOx, particulate, and CO2, which is a class one carcinogen. So these farmers would say to us, look, we agree, it's not ideal, but I want to protect our climate, and it costs me a lot less to do that. So we were in this really, really terrible area where 
there was a carbon footprint divide and an economic divide separating protecting our planet's biodiversity. I, I realized that if we are going to survive and thrive as a human species, we have to make what is best for our planet economically superior to anything else. And that's when I got the introduction of a lifetime to my co-founders, three brilliant engineers out of Silicon Valley, and we began Monarch Tractor. So I want to talk, I'll try to put pieces together, but I'd like to talk about how our tractor is go going to solve the Monarch challenge and so much more. By being all electric, we're able to bridge away from the fossil fuel era, and even when hooked up to the grid, there's an, a major impact in savings on a carbon footprint. But the beautiful thing about this is that we're able to bridge from the fossil fuel era and into a renewable era of farming. When you think about the 43 million acres of farmland in California, we have so much abundance of wind, of geothermal, of hydro, of solar. We can now get into the renewable energy business. We can basically take all of the same energy that's growing our crops, store that energy in our batteries, and deploy that later on. We actually can be, come into the energy business. 10 monarch tractors is a mega pack. That's a microgrid. We can now solve on the edge energy solutions for rural areas. By being all electric, we're helping take a big piece out of that carbon footprint that is hurting the monarch butterflies. Driver optional, the tractor is just like a normal tractor. You can get in it and you can drive it, except it has twice the torque, it's all electric, so it's much smoother than diesel and it's not loud and pollutive. <laughs> but it's also autonomous. Uh, by the way, it also has all the same hookups. So on the back, you have your PTO, your three-point hitch, your hydraulic pump. So it marries our implement yard as we have it today. Fits perfectly in. By being autonomous, there's two major factors here. The first is that it takes us as farmers out of the most dangerous place on the farm, which is in the tractor seat. Even spraying organic chemicals, you have to wear a hazmat suit. And doing that six, seven, eight hours a day is very, very, very laborious and very difficult. So it allows for us to elevate ourselves and become fleet managers away from even these organic chemical sprays, period. The other piece is that by being autonomous, so every single winter, the monarchs begin to congregate out on the coast. They're congregating right now, and they form these kaleidoscopes where they basically quasi-hibernate. And then in the spring, when all the grasses are growing and this rain has been absorbed and flowers are popping and all the other cocoons and insects are starting to come to life and the baby birds are being born, we have a decision to make as farmers. How are, what are we gonna deal with, how are we gonna deal with these grasses? Are we gonna mow these grasses? Are we gonna crimp the grasses? Are we gonna till them? Or are we gonna spray herbicide? The exciting thing about being autonomous is now you can go out and be more detailed. You can mow as much as you need to mow without the economic divide or the carbon footprint divide. On top of that, just as a little sidebar, since the Russia-Ukraine war, Roundup glyphosate has gone from $25 a gallon to $75 a gallon. All the fertilizers, all these petrol-based chemicals have absolutely tripled in, in cost, if not more. So it's becoming cost prohibitive. I have a friend who has a farm, about 4,500 acres in Lodi. We calculate that he spends about $2.2 million a year on herbicide. $2.2 million a year. By being able to be autonomous, we save him from that chemical. We save our soils from that chemical. We save our planet's biodiversity and the health from that chemical. And so as the monarchs make their way into their migratory path, they're no longer being hit with all those herbicides that are being sp sprayed in the spring. This is a big deal. So autonomy is going to help us there. Data-driven, there's a great McKinsey and Company study that says that by 2050, farms will be 70% more productive. With Monarch, we won't be just more productive. We're a vision stack, so we absorb all this data. We'll be more productive, we'll be cleaner, and we'll be greener. And so today, I'm super excited, you guys. We are embarking on a journey to help us as farmers become more profitable, more productive, and help our planet's biodiversity. So I want to thank you. Thank you, Elaine, for everything. And I'll step down now. <laughs> I just want to re-emphasize something that Carlos said, that for us to be sustainable, we have to actually be profitable. It has to be affordable for us to do what's right for our planet and for our communities. And what Carlos is describing is an effort that has been years in the making that is being delivered today, a solution that can help 
bridge this divide that Carlo just described. This effort, though, to bridge this divide, to focus on regenerative farming, to bring food into our communities in a healthy way has been ongoing for decades. And several people here are uh, with us today that have been um, founders and leaders in that movement for a long time. Food is the thing that unites us all. It's the essential that we all must have. And that means farming is also an essential that has to be addressed, that has to be respected, and that we have to give solutions to. And I am really thrilled to be able to introduce Alice Waters, who has been a leader here in California that's really truly influenced not just the entire United States, but the world in being aware of the farm to fork movement, the value of healthy food, of supporting local agriculture, and of driving regenerative agriculture. When I was speaking to her earlier today, uh, she mentioned that she actually used to be a Montessori school teacher, which I have to admit I didn't know and she trained in London. And when I found this out, it made so much sense because she has more recently taken a strong effort to bring healthy foods to schools to ensure that every student has a healthy meal. And part of how this has happened is through a program that she has brought into schools where each um, school has its own farm. It's a program um, called the Edible School Project and there are now 6,000 schools worldwide participating in the Edible School Project. <laughs> she, through the Edible School Project, she's actually united her passion for food, for farming, for healthy food, and her uh, background in Montessori schools to truly educate students at the source and help them realize that, again, food is the essential piece of our communities. And so I'm so thrilled, Alice, to invite you to the stage to speak to us today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for giving me such a great introduction, Carla. Thank you too. But um, this didn't come about because I was looking for healthy food at Chez Panisse. I was looking for taste in the late 60s. And I had gone to France. And I came back and I wanted to live like the France, French. I didn't know at that time that the French were really living in a slow food nation, if you will. All the farmers that came to Paris were only from the north of France. I don't even think they had olive oil in Paris at that time. It was all local food and directly brought in by the farmers, distributed through the big lay all um, uh, construction for distributing food in Paris. And very sadly, when that lay all disappeared and moved down to the airport, the food in France changed entirely. They started buying food like we did in the 50s. The industrial food system brought food from all around the world. Now I grew up in New Jersey in the late 40s and 50s. And so we only had, you know, food that was seasonally ripe. And actually what I found when I was looking for taste were the local organic farmers in the state of California. And uh, I wanted a farm to buy all my food from that was, could grow it and we could have that connection. And my father decided to go all around California, visit the organic farmers and find one that could grow food for Chez Panisse. Well, we were lucky because he found Bob Kennard and maybe some of you know about him but he was a regenerative biodynamic farmer before 
anybody was, was knowing about that. And it was so beautiful because my father saw, he was, my father had a victory garden and had studied agriculture, but he was one of those neat as a pin farmers, everything in rows. And he went to Bob Canards and he said, Where is, where's the food? And it was just, he pulled it back, the cover crop, and pulled out a carrot and said, my carrots are more nutritious than anybody else's, and they taste better. And so he brought those carrots back to us, and he said, this, my father, said, this is the only farm that's, farmer that's crazy enough to work with you. <laughs> and he educated us in the most beautiful way. And we started buying the food directly from him, giving him the real cost. So we didn't have any intermediate, you no know, Cisco in between us and the farmer. And so he, of course, was very, very happy that we supported him in this way. And when he told his friends, everybody wanted to sell to Chez And we immediately built a network of probably 70 farmers and ranchers and fishers that we counted on seasonally to provide all of the ingredients for Chez And I have to say that I fell in love with all of those farmers and coming down here in the rain, I want you to know it's a testimonial to my love of farmers. I count on, and ranchers as well, who take care of the land for the future of this planet. So I just wanted to tell you very quickly, I have a big plant and I call it school supported agriculture. What if the public school system decided to buy all of the food for school lunches locally and organically and regeneratively? What if they became the economic stimulus for every state in this country? Just imagine what would happen. And to have students connected, like we were connected with Bob, we go right out to the farm. He had events at the farm. Bob talked about what he was doing and why he was doing it. We got him to plant special things for us. And he got us to eat nettles and purslane. We make best nettle pizza around. But what I want to say is that we, of course, all eat, and our children all go to school, or should. And what a universal place to make a dramatic change that could affect immediately the climate and the health of all of us, to eat food that is really picked when it's ripe. That's where the taste is. So thank you. And thank you, especially those farmers, but thank you for inventing this <laughs> wonderful tractor that will help our farmers and our butterflies. It's really great. And the idea of school supported agriculture, I might say, is not just about buying that food, but it's really getting to know the people who grow it. And they are really my best friends. Thank you. It really is an honor to have a moment to share the stage with you, so thank you. I, I, I've decided that my getting emotional while public speaking, it makes me charming, so you'll just all have to be charmed by it. <laughs> um,
But Alice, I love your statement that all, really all of us being here today in the rain is a testament to our love for food and for farmers. And we have to remember that farming is about people and food is about all of us. And we have to make it possible to make this work possible. And that's what Monarch Tractor has really devoted itself to doing. In tar talking with um, Mark Schwager, who is the co-founder and president of Monarch Tractor, one of the things I was surprised to realize was that actually if you think about the logistical planning, the details that go into managing a farm year round, there's actually a lot of parallels between that effort and the logistical planning and details that go into manufacturing products like Monarch Tractor as well. It's a lot of coordination, team building, vision, and faith that the future can get us there if we do the work. Mark has uh, over a decade of experience leading manufacturing organizations, and he's developed more than 16 million square feet of manufacturing space. Did you catch that number? 16 million square feet of manufacturing space. That's a lot of logistics and details and team building. <laughs> he also was the head of the Tesla Gigafactory, taking it all the way from concept to construction. And so to go from helping to build the world's first electric vehicle to now delivering today the world's first fully electric driver optional smart tractor is really a powerful move in my mind and I'm excited to hear what you have to tell us about what made you decide to make that change. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. I'm going to weigh down my paper here. Um, so first of all, thanks everybody uh, for being here today. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank my, uh, my wife and son for putting up with a crazy start of production maniac for the past couple of months. Um, I want to thank my co-founders uh, for joining me on this journey. Zachary, uh, I wanted to make sure you were back there. Good. <laughs> Um, I want to thank our advisors, uh, our investors, our board members, our board advisors uh, for pushing us, challenging us. Um, I want to thank our, our suppliers, our partners, uh, CNHI, Foxconn, um, our customers uh, for giving us somebody to build this thing for. Um, I want to thank the entire Monarch team. Um, you know, what really makes our team and what we're doing here special is a small group of people with the dedication, the trust within each other to really get something done, something amazing done, something really valuable done, and they have the guts to take the risks and make something special. Thank you, Monarch team. Um, so when Praveen first told me that, uh, that he wanted to do this, I, um, the first thing I thought about was, what should the factory look like? Um, as, as Lane said, I, I, have, I have developed some big factories, um, but this one's my favorite one because it's, uh, it's like me, small but muddy. <laughs> and um, what we've done here is really special. Um, and um, I'm fortunate enough to um, have had the experience in manufacturing to know that technology plays an important role. Um, and I'm young enough to have always had technology in my factories to be able to uh, leverage and, and make efficiencies. Um, but I'm seasoned enough to have had some amazing experience and have figured out how to apply uh, that technology. Um, when I started looking at the opportunity and the space for, for agriculture, I didn't really see a farm as, you know, this place where there's dirt and some crops. I see it as a factory for food. Um, it's a little bit different than many of the factories where uh, I've developed where the product moves instead of the equipment, but 
the farm's the opposite. The equipment moves and uh, the product stays essentially uh, in the same spot until you pick it. Um, and so there are a lot of parallels. We care about the same things. We care about safety. We care about quality. Uh, we care about cost. Um, and that's a big piece of where any manufacturing technology plays a role and certainly where agriculture technology can play a role. Um, we talk all the time about how important the economics of the farm are and how our technology can play a role in the economics of the farm. If we want to achieve sustainability, it needs to go through economics, and we understand that. And our farmers have helped us understand that. It's the same thing in a factory. It really is. Um, I think the timing for us to be able to bring this product to market is it couldn't have been done earlier. Um, we had to wait for battery technology to come down to a cost where we could put it in our vehicles and develop something that farmers would be able to afford. We had to wait for the autonomous driving industry to develop the technologies that would enable us to bring our autonomy solutions to market. You know, agriculture is really wide open for these technologies to make, make their way into essentially the mainstream. And, you know, what I get to do here and why my job is so special is that I get to figure out how to scale it. I get to figure out how to bring it to the masses because if it's just something for, you know, just a few farmers out there, it won't have the impact that we're all hoping for. And so I really think that I get the best job, um, even though there are a lot of great jobs here. Uh, the opportunity to scale it and bring it to the masses is a tremendous opportunity and responsibility. Um, so when I was driving in today, um, I thought about how do I feel? Today's a big day. Um, how I feel today is proud. I feel proud that we've been able to do this in such a short amount of time, create a tremendously revolutionary product. The inventor, Zachary Omohundro, of this product is standing back there. I'm gonna embarrass him a little bit. Um, I have never seen anybody more brilliant and more dedicated at anything in the world than Zachary Omohundro. He has, uh, I, I don't know if he's done anything else for the last four years, quite honestly, to, uh, other than developing and perfecting this product because it's that important. It's that important of an opportunity and it's that important that we really bring something awesome to help all of our farmers achieve greater profitability and in time sustainability as well. Thank you, Zachary. It's been, it's been a challenging few months as we've perfected the product and also learned how to build it. Um, we've learned a lot about how to make an all-electric tractor and something that essentially, it's never been done before. A bi-wire, all-electric tractor that still has hydraulics, by the way, uh, a challenging system. If uh, you've all only made cars, you never really had to deal with hydraulics, so it's been a learning experience for many of us. Um, it's hard, quite frankly. It's hard to do this. Um, and it's really not for everybody. It's for people who are incredibly dedicated, specialized, and unbelievably motivated to work through these challenges. Um, these parts aren't available. It's not like you can pick them up at Home Depot. Um, we've had to leverage a global supply chain of many different partners, deal with international logistics that are unpredictable. Sometimes people lose a box of gears, you know, these things do happen. Um, and we've managed to rally through all of that. And the evidence today is that the tractor is there and we've overcome all of these challenges from design to procure, to logistics, to manufacturing, to validation and quality, we've overcome it all. There are many companies out there that say that they're going to build and deliver electric vehicles, and very few do. And I'm really proud of our team for 
delivering on our mission and starting today. It's truly astonishing that we've been able to do this with a shoestring budget and faster than anybody else out there. So again, our team is just... Uh, where we go from here is uh, also really important. Um, our, our model is to develop the products next door in, uh, in 203 and then industrialize them here in, in 151. So each building has a different purpose, R&D and then industrialization. Um, a big piece of why we're able to be here today showing you tractors is because we've, we've got a, a team of people here from our partner Foxconn who've been building alongside with us, learning the build so that they can take it to the next step and scale this in Ohio. I think it's really important to use all of the resources available to us. We've got tremendous people here in California. We've got tremendous people in Ohio. Um, what I love about being in manufacturing and always having been in manufacturing is it's really good for our country um, to have the ability to produce real things. I know that manufacturing as labor has uh, essentially have since 1980, but I've always thought it was weird. Um, why should it be? Um, America was built on, on making things, and um, we get to use every state in the union to do that. Actually, many of I, I think we probably have parts from half of, uh, of the states um, in the country. And um, what we'll be doing in Ohio is scaling what we develop here, but we'll continue to develop products and work them through our system here. So essentially, we're going to be expanding our footprint in both locations, and I'm really proud um, that not only are we able to do so much in California, is that we can do things all over the country as well. Um, most of all, um, I think I'm just proud um, of, of all of us to be able to show you what's going to come out of that door in a little bit. And um, I think I'm proud that um, I've had the opportunity to be a part of it. And... Uh, Doing something special gives your life meaning, and uh, this gives me a lot of meaning. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mark. That point that it takes a whole team to make a change like this happen is so crucial. And the truth is that it takes partnerships around the country and around the world to make this happen as well. I, standing up here looking out across the, the room, the tent of people, I can see there are people with farms of all sizes, small family farms, um, larger corporate farms as well, everything in between, and across different types of agricultural crops as well, and it's really quite inspiring to see that. For something like Monarch Tractor, which we're launching today, to have an impact Partnerships have to be global, and they have to have that scale that Mark was talking about. And one of the companies that has stepped forward with strong interest in Monarch Tractor is Constellation Brands, which is a global company and one of the world leaders in beer, wine, and spirits. And I'm thrilled today to introduce Robert Hansen. <laughs> President of the Wine and Spirits Div Division of Constellation Brands. Hello, everybody. Elaine, that was, that's one of the best introductions I've ever had. I promise you. <laughs> I was actually going to start with you, Elaine. I'm going to go a bit off script, uh, Carlo and Praveen and Mark and Elaine, so bear with me for one second. Because uh, I was really inspired uh, listening to your opening comments, uh, obviously the amazing comments from Carlo and uh, your passion, Mark, and, and listening to Alice earlier as well. I, it's sort of serendipitous for me. I'm going to tell you a little story and then I'll get to the point of uh, why I'm here talking to you today. I grew up in Sonoma County. I was a kid from the other side of the tracks. Um, and uh, just, Carlo, your comments about 
the environmental impact and just the reality of how, what you see happened in Santa Rosa, which is my hometown, uh, and have had family and friends impacted by those fires, uh, the commitment that you have from a passion standpoint to be a part of a change which is so essential to our world is important to me personally. Um, Elaine, you know, you talked about being emotional. I think some of the most underused skills in life and aspects of being a human being is bringing passion and love uh, and a commitment to affecting change, as you spoke about, Mark, uh, to what we do in business. Um, and then for all the farmers out there, personally, I'll, I'll share with you, I come from a big family. I have uh, had uh, nine aunts and uncles. 50% uh, of them were lawyers, and no offense to any of the lawyers in the crowd if you're here. I liked the other 50% a lot better. They were all farmers. So there you have it. That's a little bit of, uh, about me. But the, the reason we're really here, I, I met Praveen and Carlo a couple years ago um, at a drink that we had at the Archer Hotel in Napa. Uh, and part of what I'm trying to change with my colleagues in the wine and spirits business that are here with me today, including our chief operating officer, Sam Glatzer, uh, who runs our global operations, is uh, to be decisive and really change the company from what it had been to being um, a, a company that's super committed to farming in the right place and creating an incredibly well-crafted product of the highest quality uh, and recognizing that we can't sustain that unless we're committed to farming in the right way. Uh, without water, without healthy land, without the ability to have incredibly built products that taste amazing, that people want to consume, we don't have an industry uh, in the future. And as we sat that uh, evening and had a glass, shared a glass of wine together, um, just hearing the idea that uh, Praveen and Carlo had together um, and their passion for really changing this industry and the impact it could have on the world in which we live, we just said yes. We were introduced by Andy Erickson, one of our amazing winemakers, and I think Carlo and Praveen were a little surprised because they're like, hmm, that's not necessarily the Constellation brands we know, um, but you just said yes to being our first partner and committing to buy uh, to, uh, six of the um, you know, Monarch uh, and, uh, Founder Series MKV tractors because it was just the right decision to take. Because here's the thing about what we're trying to accomplish. We believe, I believe personally, but I feel I found a home at Constellation Brands uh, because we believe that business not only has to be a source of economic opportunity, you all need to be able to make livings and feed your families uh, and uh, prepare your children for a future, etc., as Carlo talked about earlier, and to do so in a healthy planet. But we believe business can not only be a source of economic opportunity, it has to be a force for positive change in the world. And I found a home in a company that really fundamentally feels that. And that's important because I've worked in places where that hasn't been the case in the past. And it was just the wrong home for me. Um, why we're so excited about this partnership is these first six tractors are going to be uh, used to help farm uh, our collectively, given the heritage of the Mandavi family with Constellation Brands, uh, our amazingly world-renowned Toklan Vineyard. Uh, all of our uh, vineyards are uh, sustainably farmed. Uh, the Tokalon Vineyards can actually be organically certified uh, in the, with the spring budding in, two, uh, in 2023. And to be able to bring these six tractors, uh, to be able to bring these six tractors to the Tokalon Vineyard, uh, it's sort of serendipitous, Carlo. I think it honors uh, you know, your grandfather's, uh, the amazing, uh, uh, the amazing accomplishment of your family and your grandfather to have, have uh, you know, put Napa Valley on the global stage of one of the most important places where high quality wines come from. But to be able to use the tractors on the Tokalon Vineyard uh, as we organically certify it uh, and to be a part of the change that you're driving is really exceptional for, for us. We're committed, obviously, to water uh, preservation, but also to reduce our emissions. And to hear the statistics that they talked about and what the impact of this would be, and to be able to convert over time our entire tractor fleet to electric, uh, and to think about how we're putting back health into the soil to create the kind of future that you spoke about is really, you know, essentially what we're committed to. It's also really important for all the farmers in the audience to understand that we don't think that we can continue to produce like incredibly well-crafted wines unless we really change the way we farm. 
and to farm this way in the future. Uh, we have the Tokelon Vineyard is, you know, the top five vineyards in the world. Uh, and, you know, we're proud we, you know, we had, we're, Double Diamond is one of the brands that uh, sources grapes off of Tokelon. It was just named the number one uh, wine brand of 2022 on Wine Spectator. More importantly to me personally is Robert Mondavi Estates Cab was named number six. Uh, uh, and that's also uh, farmed off of Tokelon Vineyard. But if you bring the whole thing full circle, it's not possible to sustain that unless we do what we're going to do together. And so we're so honored to receive the first six keys um, of your Founder Series tractors uh, and to recognize that we have a responsibility as a leader in the industry to show the way. And we're hoping that we can not only be your first partner um, with these six tractors, but to actually be the catalyst for our peers in the industry and frankly, any any uh, industry that farms to be able to follow our lead and partner with you moving forward to really change the world. So it's an honor. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Elaine, but it's really an exceptional thing you're doing. Thank you. I want to remind all of us that are here today that we influence each other. What Robert was just talking about is that we have the ability to influence those around us by not only talking about what we've learned and witnessed today, but also talking about why what we're witnessing today matters and at the role each of us can take to expand that change and expand that improvement. And so with that in mind, I'm thrilled to welcome to the stage co-founder and CEO of Monarch Tractor, Praveen Pinmetsa, for almost for almost two decades, Praveen has been translating creative vision into delivery of a product, which is, and we're witnessing yet another example of that today. He has worked with companies from startups to Fortune 50 companies, and has been invested in working in the ag tech solutions space since 2016. He has really quite a remarkable story about his history in farming, his work with um, the global uh, farming crisis and finding solutions for remote communities and, and his work in other technology um, spaces as well. So I'm thrilled to, to welcome Praveen. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Elaine. Uh, again, today we have heard from Alice, we have heard from Carlo, uh, we have heard from Robert on how important it is with the farmers and the food ecosystem. Today, more than ever, for the first time, food security is a new word that has come into the fore, forefront of our lexicon over the last couple of years, and especially with the Ukraine war. But also keep in mind that our food ecosystem has been under pressure for a very long time. I want to share a small story of how Zachary and I, when we took that small red tractor to India, and we showcased it to the Indian farmers there, and we said, here is an electric tractor that is going to make farming sustainable. It's going to help you with your diesel fuel costs. The farmer had three very basic questions. The first question was, who's going to drive it? And I was like, wait a second, what are you talking about, right? You're the farmer, you're going to drive it. And they're like, no, there's only two drivers in the whole village who can drive the tractor, and it's a very skilled operation. The second question that they had was, how is this going to save money for me and make more money for me? Very clear-cut questions that the farmers had. And what we found out, Zachary and I, on that day was the farmer, and this specific farmer had only four acres of land, was growing fruits and vegetables. And when we asked him about his motivation, he said, the whole point is I want to make enough money to send my kid to college so that he can get away from farming because there is no future in farming. I want to repeat what he said, right? He said, I want to educate my kid with the money that I make from my four acre farm so that my kid can do something else because there is no future in farming. We've all talked a lot about how important our food is. We've all realized it even more over the last couple of years. But farmers around the world are really struggling. 
We all know that the data is now coming out that less than half of them actually make any money in farming. And not only that, we have also realized that now we have to transition this to a sustainable way of conducting these operations because we have heard from Alice, we have heard from Carlo on how the food that we eat is impacted by the climate and the way we farm. So with that in mind, right, it's amazing that on this day, and thanks to the support of a wide variety of partners who are in the crowd today, and that's a combination of federal and state agencies that have joined us today, whether it's David from the California Energy Commission, who's here, whether it's our local state uh, government officials, whether it's the California Air Resource Board, global equipment partners like Case New Holland, who are here, whether it's some of the largest thought leaders in farming. We all have a duty to not only showcase that it is possible to farm profitably, it is pro uh, possible to farm sustainably, and we have to showcase that. And that whole challenge starts here, starts today. And I cannot think of a better partner than Robert and Constellation Brands, because to his point, in that conversation two years ago, it was one thing for Robert to commit, but over the last two years, we have seen Constellation not only engage with us on the farm side of things, on how can we use Monarch technologies to farm sustainably and farm more efficiently, but also we have engaged with them on how do we integrate these technologies. And most importantly, our two teams on the sustainability side have worked together over the last two years to make sure that the things that we are doing are scalable and sustainable. So with that, I'm going to call Robert over to hand over the keys to the tractor. And uh, <laughs> Robert, thanks a lot. So let's, uh, let's all take a look and see what these tractors look like. So let's pull the tractors out. So please hold position. And uh, let's see uh, these tractors roll off from this beautiful factory. What we have here is our all-electric driver optional, and you've seen one with the driver and one without all-electric smart tractors, and these are going to bridge between farm profitability and our food uh, ecosystem sustainability. So thanks a lot for everybody for joining us. I want to hand it back to Elaine uh, for some housekeeping items at this point. So thanks a lot for the support. Thank you so much again for, to all of you for being here, even in the rain. Um, those of you that are interested in a tour of the factory, we actually are offering those um, today. And you can meet at the curtain. Um, no photos are allowed inside the warehouse, but we'd love to uh, share with you how the work is being done. Um, and we also would like to welcome you to enjoy the reception and the lunch, which will be back in the um, previous tent area. And um, those of you that are here for a corporate development, there's going to be a meeting at 1, and we can uh, meet at the curtain for that as well. Thank you so much again to everybody for being here. Thank you to Monarch Tractor for having me and to the entire team for this momentous day. Congratulations. Congratulations.